Imagine eight people in quarantine for two years. We're just trying to get through a few months here and we're losing our minds. So today's film definitely resonates for 2020. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. I gotta say today we were really glad to have Matt Wolf, the director of Spaceship Earth with us for our latest episode. And it was an experiment that we did. First off, Backstory Magazine has partnered with Neon, the distributor of Spaceship Earth. And if you wanna watch the film, please go to backstory.net slash Spaceship Earth. Couldn't be easier, right? On that page, you'll find a link that will lead directly to a page where you could rent Spaceship Earth for $4.99 and half the proceeds of that will actually go to Backstory Magazine through our partnership. So please, if you're gonna watch it, I hope you use that link to watch it and spread the link to friends and family. And then afterwards, you could see the Q&A that I did with Matt Wolf about Spaceship Earth through Backstory Magazine's YouTube page, which is something that we've newly launched. We did a live stream of the Q&A, so we took questions from our virtual audience, and we did it all on YouTube, and now an archived edition of it is on YouTube as well. So if you search out Backstory Magazine on YouTube, you'll easily find it there, and that's one way to listen. Of course, it's also still in our podcast as well. I, I gotta say, there's a lot of amazing things that we talked about. This documentary has so much depth to it and definitely resonates for 2020 that I really hope you'll take a look because I think you'll enjoy it. You could, of course, also see a trailer for it on our page as well. Um, anyhow, we're, we're gonna be putting out issue 42 of Backstory Magazine. It's kind of a, a financial risk in this crazy day and age, so I hope you'll support us. If you, wanna, if you wanna subscribe, you could use coupon code SAVE5 at backstory.net, and that will get you a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with director Matt Wolf about his documentary, Spaceship Earth. So first off, I loved your film. And you. to give our audience just kind of a sense of who you are as a filmmaker, I wanna go back to the beginning. So did you study film somewhere? Had, had you gone to film school or anything like that? Yeah, I went to NYU's film school back in, I started in 2000 and uh, graduated in 2004. So that's how I got it, started making films. Okay, that makes sense. And did you go there knowing that you were gonna do primarily documentaries or were you thinking that you would maybe do features as well? No, I, I definitely, I got inspired by a lot of what you might call 90s new queer cinema. Uh, filmmakers like Todd Haynes and Derek Jarman, um, Tom, Tom, um, Tom Kalen and Isaac Julian, all these kind of filmmakers who were making alternative gay indie films. And I thought that's what I would do. And I got to film school and realized I didn't want to do that, but became involved kind of in the art world and video art and doing stuff that had nothing to do with documentaries. Um, but I had a film professor, Kelly Reichart, and she um, is a great filmmaker. And she really kind of inspired me to think again about doing feature films. And so when I left school, I had that both interest in doing experimental stuff, but also in doing um, features. And I started making a film about a musician named Arthur Russell. And I was interviewing people and I got the sense as I was interviewing people that I wasn't making an experimental film, I was making a documentary. And I was, and um, that documentary turned out to be my first film, Wild Combination. So and that was, that was of, 2008, your first film, Wild Combination, A Portrait of Arthur Russell. Yeah, I kind of stumbled into making documentaries by accident. But after that film, I realized that's a space I thrive in. So I kept doing it. You know, your next film, Teenage, in 2013, you worked with John Savage. And he's, he's just a... He's a great personality, and I'm just curious what that experience was like working with him on that film. And, and before I get to that, what your biggest lesson was on your first film, which I just forgot to ask. Uh, I think my biggest lesson on my first film was to really, that you can find yourself in the material without it being about yourself. I never have had an interest in making a film about myself or using my own voice in my films. Um, but I really saw a lot of myself and my own experience in the story of the subject of Wild Combination, a musician named Arthur Russell. And um, I, it was instructive for me because he was an artist who did all sorts of different things under different monikers. He made disco music and he played avant-garde cello music. 
And as a result of him having so many different facets and identities, he wasn't really recognized during his lifetime. But um, when his music was being re-released, people appreciated the breadth of what he was doing. So not only did I see myself in the story of his relationship and living in New York and being an artist, but I also felt this kind of assurance that I could do all sorts of different things. I didn't have to continue making a film like that one. And that with time, there would be a continuous line of thought or a thread through all of them. And so that did give me the confidence in a way to make this film Teenage, which is based on a book by John Savage. And John is considered kind of the biggest thinker on punk. He wrote the, the book England's Dreaming, which is sort of the definitive intellectual history of punk rock in England. He, he's amazing. And yeah, he's a really seminal music journalist who was the first person to to kind of cover what was happening in Manchester in the 70s at Hacienda with bands like Joy Division, um, and as well as the punk scene um, in the UK. And he's an influential music critic, but also a kind of cultural historian. And he wrote this book, Teenage, which really tells the story of the birth of teenagers and the origins of early youth culture at the turn of the century, up until the year 1945, when the term teenager was coined. So the book doesn't make sense as a film. It was like a very ambitious idea, but I wanted to make a kind of unusual historical film that was different than what you would see on PBS. And John and I went into it really as collaborators. And it turned out that he had collected hundreds of primary sources of, um, of materials where you could hear the voices of youth from different youth cultures and countries from this whole period, the interwar period. And um, we, we ended up making a script together based on quotes, these actual quotes from youth that tells the story of the birth of teenagers. So we had a really great transcontinental collaboration. I was in Wales where he is, he came to New York and we were on Skype all the time. And it was a great time in my life just learning from him and working with him. I mean, it sounds fantastic. And uh, obviously your next project, you know, Recorder, the Marion Stokes project, it, it's something that documentarians always grapple with, and we're going to talk about it a little later for Spaceship Earth. But, you know, I've read that you had over 70,000 hours of videotape because Marion Stokes was recording television uh, just to have an archive of her own. So being able to, to kind of manage going through footage like that and finding a story out of it, I'm sure there were a lot of lessons learned on that. And that's, that's, that's my last pre-Spaceship Earth question. Tell us, tell us about that. Sure. So Marion Stokes was an idiosyncratic activist who lived in Philadelphia, and um, she was an eccentric, very politicized woman who um, decided at the birth of the 24-hour news cycle um, in 1979 during the Iranian hostage crisis to record television 24 hours a day. And she did so on multiple networks for 30 years. Um, she was trying to protect the truth because she was concerned that the producers of news were distorting the truth through the predilection of their own bias, which of course is a very prescient idea now. And she amassed not 70,000 hours, 70,000 extended play VHS and Betamax tapes. Right. So hun hundreds right. of thousands right. of hours. But um, I had to engage in a unique process to kind of choose a hundred select tapes from that. But, but those are six to eight hour tapes. So I had 700 hours of archival footage, but had a whole elaborate process to figure out what I was looking for and, and even to index the whole collection, just like a librarian. So, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt just, just for our viewers out there. So that's an important part of the process that, that obviously you would talk about for spaceship earth as well. It's the process at which a documentarian starts logging footage. So you're taking time codes if you've striped your tapes with time code, you're making notes as to what it is, and then you're trying to, out of that, call something else. So how long was your logging process to even find those 700 hours? Well, it's not even logging. Um, Marion Stokes wrote the kind of metadata, dates, times, and networks, and sometimes other information on the spine of all of her 70,000 tapes. And wow. we created a conveyor belt system and took photographs of the top of these cardboard filing boxes where the tapes were stored, spine up. And then those photographs um, 
were put into Dropbox and we put out a call for volunteers and miraculously 50 people around the world signed up to, to start logging Marianne's tapes. So with the shared Google spreadsheet and Dropbox photos, um, people started to transcribe what she wrote on the spines of the tapes. And eventually a full-time archivist came on and completed that index with 70,000 entries on a Google spreadsheet. How long did, how long did the crowdsourcing take? Um, the whole process took probably nine months. And then- Just to long. Yeah, and then wow. I used um, Wikipedia to identify kind of a wish list of dates with interesting things I was looking for. And our archivist would go through the database and find the tape, but someone at the archive had to get a forklift and take down a pallet that had tons of boxes and then go in the box and find the actual tape, which had six to eight hours of footage on it. So wow. it's not even logging. It's like more, it's even, it's a weirder, it's like being a librarian kind of to, to be able to find really special stuff within that much material. Well, so how did you find out about Spaceship Earth? I know it's the old, you know, like what, what led to Biosphere 2 as being, you know, a documentary Spaceship Earth. I know it's the most over-asked questions. You don't have to spend a lot of time on it because I want to dig deeper into the other stuff. But I, everyone's, I mean, not everyone, but many people have been aware of it. What wasn't aware was that there was a filmic archive of, yeah. you know, predating Biosphere 2. So what led you to Spaceship Earth? Um, I saw a striking photograph on the internet of eight people in bright red jumpsuits in front of a glowing glass pyramid. And I, I thought it was a still from a science fiction film, but it didn't take me long to realize that in fact, the structure is real and that those eight people had lived inside of it for two years. And I was determined to tell their story. And, um, you know, I immediately started to learn that in fact, the prehistory of Biosphere 2 and the, the kind of unusual countercultural group that conceived of the project was just as interesting of a story. So I went to Synergia Ranch, the, common, the commune in New Mexico where they live, and um, I visited that group and I was brought into this temperature controlled room that had hundreds of 16 millimeter films and analog videotapes, as well as thousands of stills. And um, it was just astonishing. It's kind of a documentary filmmaker's dream, particularly for me, since I work with so much archival footage it's a Byzantine story with so many twists and turns, but what's so remarkable is that most elements of this story were filmed and not only filmed, but filmed well. So besides that huge archive at the Synergia Ranch, one of the Biospherians, Roy Walford, inside had filmed his daily life with, with several hundred more hours of footage. So we had just an incredible wealth of material to tell this totally bizarre and, and fascinating story. I mean, it's crazy. And it seems like your previous experience, especially on, you know, the film right before this really helped you to be able to go through an archive like that because you had, you had the process in place. Uh, yeah, but it was a different no? process. I think every single film, particularly for documentaries, requires a unique process that relates to the material. And what I was fortunate to have was a really experienced and robust team who came out with me, Brian Becker, Annie Salsich came out, um, there are story producers and archivists who came out to New Mexico with me and did that indexing process to really create a library kind of Dewey Decimal system out of all the material in New Mexico. And we had to thread these 16 millimeter films through an old Steenbeck uh, analog film editing machine that happened to be in the old barn at the commune. And we hired a guy from uh, New Mexico to take videotapes off the little preview window, which we edited with before doing fancy telecine transfers of that footage. And that guy knew someone who had Betacam and three quarter U-Matic and DVCam tape decks. And, and Annie and Brian would watch back the footage and, and add metadata to our database. And, and then once all that footage came in, they were, they were really meticulously organizing it, hitting a marker when any of our subjects were on screen and, creating keywords so that our editor, David T, could really search through it. And so it really, you know, it's never just me. It's always a bigger group process. For a recorder, it was this crowdsourced thing. And for this, we had a full team really dedicated to making sense of all this material. How many hours did you wind up choosing that you were going to make as your selects that led to the documentary? It's usually a couple hundred for documentarians. Yeah, we had 600 hours of footage for this one. So okay. I, I'm finding for an archive rich film, that's kind of the sweet spot of material. It's, it's fascinating though, because you're, you're dealing with so many years with this one group, you know, you have your commune days, the ranch days, 
I, I was really intrigued by the theater. You're showing little bits of it. Did, just out of sheer curiosity, were they writing their own plays and scripts or were they performing yeah. classics? Yeah, the theater was really the project of Kathleen Gray, one of the subjects of the film, and then John Allen, the, the kind of gregarious leader of the group who was often the playwright and Kathleen was the dramaturge who would, um, you know, um, imagine the kind of theatrical scenography for everything. But they were really interested in reimagining historical plays um, as well as coming up with their own kind of experimental dramas, which in some ways allegorized or fantasized about projects they wanted to do, including space colonization. So um, they were very playful in a way, but they also were very earnest trying to grapple with um, history, but also these extraterrestrial ambitions too. Did they ever, did they ever publish any? Like, is there well, any yeah, other? there there are publications that have some of the plays. I actually have like a comic book of one that I love called Kabuki Blues. It's not something that's accessible to everybody, but I, I was given a copy. But there's that you can find on eBay or sometimes on Etsy. Um, if you search Theater of All Possibilities, you can find some of their plays, and they're fascinating to read as text as well. We're, you know, we're living in kind of like a golden age of streaming, obviously. And a lot of documentarians are now deciding, should it be a film or should it be a series, like a limited series? Did you ever consider the limited series approach for something that had the scope of, of what became Spaceship Earth? Or, or yeah. would you still consider going back with some of your footage and re-examining it as a, as a limited edition series? I did pitch it as a series initially, and I'm so happy that it ended up being a film. It wasn't greenlit as a series, it was greenlit as a film. And it's a long film, it's two hours, but I'm so satisfied it is because the ending of this film and this story is pretty nuanced in terms of, you know, this is a project without spoiling it for people who haven't seen it, but it, it, um, it ends in an abrupt way. Um, the project's taken over and, and the fallout from that in the afterlife is difficult to, to kind of grapple with thematically. It's kind of like the story ends when all of your characters are ousted from their project. But I think, um, I wanted to do something that felt thematically rich and, and substantive afterwards, not just in terms of what happened, but in terms of really landing on some big ideas. And I find what's most challenging and often problematic about doc series is that they kind of peter out. They don't have a satisfactory ending, um, mostly because of the demands to just stretch out the material. So this film is kind of in three chapters. It definitely could have been a kind of three episode suite, but um, what I really like is that the ending isn't prolonged. The, end, the film kind of wraps up in, in a quick but meaningful way. So I found the ending to be the hardest part of the film to craft. And I'm so happy it was in the context of a feature, not a series where I was doing that. Could you see an afterlife for it where you would go back to some of the footage that you didn't have room for in the film and just kind of show a little more of what was going on inside the, the biosphere, et cetera? No, I think okay. uh, I, I chose the stuff I was interested in. I'm like one of those people. I make a lot of choices in partnership with my editor, David Teague, and I never look back. You know, it's, it's interesting because the WGA recognized about, you know, a few years back uh, documentaries as, as having screenplays that are written. At what point after you're logging your footage, did you finally start seeing the threads of the script? And you don't have to go into story details so much as logistics. We'll have a spoiler section that we'll get to in a little while. Um, I, come, I come to the entire process with a pretty clear sense of what the story is in advance, both in terms of researching, in terms of themes, in terms of characters. And that's usually informed by pre-interviewing potential subjects for the film to get a sense of their point of view and to better understand the story and contrasting perspectives on it. And so I kind of cast a documentary with these subjects in advance and have a sense of the stories that they have to tell. And I do a lot of other additional research to inform that. And then I, you know, as I'm pitching a film, I have to write a detailed treatment. So I've often written a kind of map of what the film is. And so when we go into the research process, we're looking for specific things. Of course, we're grabbing a huge amount of material, but it's not just anything or everything in sight. It has to be more targeted than that. So um, there's that. And then when I, you know, when I shoot all of my interviews all at once, that's partially how I work as a filmmaker. It's kind of like writing the film, but doing it with 
everybody all at once. And the way I write questions is like writing a script. It's, I have a structure in mind for the conversations and I'm, I'm seeking coverage to cover the overall story I'm telling. Of course, it goes in directions I wouldn't expect with anecdotes I couldn't have ever anticipated and led. But um, in so many ways, it's kind of written before the interviewing process and the archival, um, di the archival logging really begins. So that people are looking for really specific things. But of course they find things that move things in different directions. So, um, you know, it's always a kind of targeted process um, in which it's not that we discover the story in the material, it's that we discover new opportunities for the story in the mater material and we find specific ways to solve storytelling problems with the material that exist. So wouldn't that mean that sometimes when somebody gives you a new piece of information and you find one of your surprises, that you then need to go redo an interview and rethink a section uh, of somebody that you might have already interviewed? It's, you know, the surprises aren't typically plot story surprises. They're more emotional surprises or anecdotal things that are cinematic. Um, it's rare that I'm learning new facets of a story while interviewing somebody, maybe, but I, tip, I have almost never re-interviewed anyone. I do pickups right at the end of the film, audio pickups just to get some sound bites that I need um, for, for like really targeted specific information, but I have never actually gone and shot a master interview twice with somebody. I really go in super prepared and have never come to an interview with a substantial surprise about story. And if it was a surprise, a kind of revelation, it wouldn't be a domino effect that changes the entire story. It would be a unique twist. But, um, you know, it's the, the real surprise is stuff like, okay, like when in, in the film, for those who've seen it, we, we use this book called Mount Analog that the character the subject Kathleen Gray is reading when she meets John Allen, who becomes the leader of this group. And they're on a bus in San Francisco and she's reading a book about a group of people who go on a journey to find an island that doesn't exist on a map. And she told that story during the interview and it was really fascinating because it's kind of analogous with what this group ended up doing. They even built a boat and traveled around the world and they built this miniature world that didn't exist. Um, and so um, it, only in their imagination. And so um, my editor, David Teague, had the, the great idea to use that as, as a kind of, almost like a literary device to get us into the story and to look at the ambition and, and creativity of this group. And um, that's the kind of thing I had, would have no idea about when I was making the film. Um, there would be another archival shot that we found. It's they're traveling around the world and they're at, I think, Mayan ruins. And there's a staircase that goes, it ends. It's like a ruin, a staircase that goes. It, to it goes up into they, the sky. It goes up into the sky and just stops. It was crazy. So yeah, all of our subjects run up a staircase that has no destination. I mean, right. so one couldn't, um, it's a very metaphorical image that also ties into the, the idea of Mount Analog and, and the idea of this group and where are they going and what is the destination. And I think these, there's something philosophical and metaphorical about it. And those are the things that I couldn't know about if I, regardless of how prepared I am. And those discoveries are what add another layer to the film, but you have to have really storytelling savvy collaborators to see a shot like a group of people running up the stairs and not just be like, oh, that's a cool shot, but to potentially say, look at this, you know, this could be something interesting. And, and, and there's tons of material and I saw that and I don't remember who thought it first, but I was like, that's a insane and profoundly meaningful shot in the context of our story. And for a while it was the final shot of the film, but that didn't make sense in the end. So. It's, uh, it's a poignant and meaningful image. You know, something that you did on Recorder and obviously on Arthur Russell, you have your subject and you know, you have your periphery of characters. Here you have a very large ensemble. What yeah. difficulty did you find? Because some, you know, many documentaries, they have that one person that they're gonna peg it on. And I thought maybe it was gonna be John Allen at first, but then once I settled in, I realized it really was an ensemble experience. Yeah, and I found that to be an exciting challenge. I usually try to make a film, I, most of my films are interview based with the exception of Teenage. 
And I typically try to make those films with as concentrated and small of a cast of characters as possible so that people aren't just conveying information, but that you really come to know the people who are telling the story um, and you feel a connection to them emotionally. And I think what I recognized um, was that this isn't a film about a leader of a group. I didn't find John Allen to be compelling enough to lead an entire epic story. I found him to be a centerpiece and an axis in which a lot of different people revolved around and that the conflicts he faced as an individual were, um, you know, had a ripple effect across the entire story. But I think um, that at the end of the day, it's a film about this model of small groups and that it, it was a network of individuals who, who were part of these two small groups, both the, the synergists, the group from the commune that came up with the idea of Biosphere 2 and then the Biospherians, the, those who lived inside. So, you know, that was, it, I would call it a network of characters who all had relationships to each other, but needed to cohere as these distinct groups. So that was a really interesting challenge that I enjoyed dealing with. When you shoot, how many cameras do you like to shoot on for an interview? Um, for this film, because there was so much footage, I chose to just shoot on one camera. I didn't think I would need to do jump cuts, but it depends. Like if a film doesn't have expansive coverage, like Recorder had very limited coverage of the subject, Marion Stokes, I would shoot with two cameras to deal with lack of coverage so that we can make jump cuts. Um, it's, I prefer to just make a choice and to have that one choice than to have tons of choices. It's really a practical consideration of editorial needs because the interviews are so heavily edited, which I guess not everybody totally knows. Yeah. Just a few other logistics before we get to the, uh, to the spoiler section, you know, did you say how long your, your interview period was? I can't remember if I asked that. I mean, the entire film took a year and a half to make. And okay. the interviews were done all at once. So only probably a couple of months. There was okay. probably a gap, a gap in there, but we, we shot interviews in blocks, one in New York and then a, a chunk in LA and, and, a chunk in Tucson and a chunk in New Mexico. So over the course of several months in all those different locations, we, we kind of interviewed everybody all at once. And we'll get into the, to the details of the editing, the spoiler section, but how long did it take to edit, would you say? Um, 32 weeks. Okay. <laughs> However long that is. I, I yeah, always yeah, budget yeah. edits for 32 weeks. So all right. it's, uh, it's how, how many months is that? I don't know. That's, that's about uh, three, right? No. No. Four weeks, thirty-two four weeks. divided by four. That would that would be six weeks. Ten. Six weeks yes. almost. Sorry. No, no, no. Ten. Six weeks? That no. No. I should never be doing math on a thirty two weeks. All I know is weeks. I... it's uh okay, I can't do it. Yeah, it's eight. It's eight. <laughs> it's, okay. It's almost like the birth of a child. It's it is. It um, is, it is. Uh well so so preemie, okay, so the preemie. Yeah. So, so basically we're going to get into the spoiler section. If you, if you haven't yet seen Spaceship Earth, go see Spaceship Earth. And uh, we even have a special link from Backstory Magazine that you could view it for because we partnered with Neon. Um, but so we're going to get into the spoilers now. Um, you know, it's interesting that there were controversies that were discussed in the movie because the, the, the thing about Biosphere 2 is that if it really was something that was practicing for colonization on other worlds, which is very important because as many scientists, including Carl Sagan have said, we have all of our eggs in one basket by staying here on earth. If there's anything that's a global crisis, you know, we're, we're, we're all stuck here just like we are right now in quarantine. So space exploration would be very helpful. But the controversy in the movie is that they were using at one point possibly a CO2 scrubber because there was too much carbon monoxide. And it was interesting that the press got really mad about it because the original goal was to only use a closed environment with no other outside help. So a CO2 scrubber was looked at as cheating, but it's very strange because a CO2 scrubber is used on spaceships like, like the shuttle, like, like the ships that we already had in use at the time when they were doing that. So do you think it was just because it had become such a big project that they didn't have the savvy to deal with the press that using a CO2 scrubber is not the end of the world and the scientific experiment that they were doing as a whole was still a little bigger than did they have to use a scrubber? 
Yeah, I mean, I personally don't find the CO2 scrubber to be that objectionable or interesting. It's kind of like... But the press blew it up. Yeah, I mean, but the press was becoming skeptical of the project because the management wasn't speaking to them and disclosing information in general. So the the issue was non-disclosure. It wasn't necessarily the technology, although that became the focus of it. I think the project had a lot of different goals, and those goals were nuanced um, and confusing. I mean, they were interested in piloting space colonization and developing tools and technologies for that, but it was also a model and demonstration for sustainable living on Earth. Um, but in so many senses, it was also a human experiment that once attracting the media's attention, stoked a kind of voyeuristic entertainment to the extent that there were people making pilgrimages to the desert to see the biospherians. And I think that the more entertainment-based aspect of the project, which wasn't necessarily their goal, but became a huge dimension of the project. In that space, it was defined really clearly. These eight people are going in for two years, nothing comes in and nothing goes out. And I think it didn't really, they, they wanted to, to really understand atmospheric dynamics to see if a closed system like this could work. Right. And, and I mean, it was an experiment in that sense, but uh, an elaborate and spectacular and theatrical experiment and um, I don't think it really mattered if things came in or out. That wasn't, for many of the Biospherians, really the point. But um, in, in so many senses, it, it was as if ground rules had been established and that um, they were being held to them. So when Jane Pointer came out after she injured her finger in a grain thrasher, thrasher um, that, that began to stoke the controversy and the kind of big brother voyeurism and, and the management of the project didn't handle the media correctly and they didn't fully disclose that they where they came from it was nobody knew prior that they were theater performers from a commune instead of academic scientists and and all of this non-disclosure created just a lot of skepticism i mean you're in the media i'm in the media when people try to hide stuff all it does is make you want to know Right. It's and, still funny, um, though, that the, the media got so angry because it was a privately funded project. It wasn't a government project that was supposed to have any sort of an oversight. It was completely f privately funded, and that's why they could be theater academic scientists that could go in there because it was their project. No one could tell them what they yeah, did, what to do. But people are snarky and cynical, and I think oh, yeah. it, it feels indulgent to a lot of people for a group of outliers to get this much resources to do a bonkers right. space colonization project. I think there was something magnificent and, and, and um, spectacular about what they were doing in that it was instructive and meaningful and incredible that people could achieve this and had the resourcefulness and the determination to do it regardless of the clarity of its goals or its usefulness for society. But I think, I mean, and even putting out the film, I'm conscious of this, there's just a certain kind of snarkiness and cynicism amongst people who are skeptics, you know? And I think people came to this project with a lot of skepticism because of how much showmanship was part of it and how bizarre the entire thing was. I mean, they were all in these bright red jumpsuits like astronauts, it was yeah. bizarre. It was a bizarre project. That's what draws me to it personally. But um, I think that, um, yeah, so there was a certain kind of cynicism and when, and this carbon scrubber, I mean, they had huge electricity facilities. The, the whole thing yeah, of was course. relying on electricity to control the temperature or everything would die or there's mechanical waves that are being yeah that's 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 why i thought it was strange and and you, i'm curious if there were any other controversies or, or things that you really wanted to hold on to during editing but you just realized for runtime for pacing for character arcs it didn't make sense just anything else that was like a well, the, interesting the moment aspect Cut of out. the story which is juicy that we didn't include but that there just wasn't room in the context of a film to include is that there was a second mission after the first biosphereans left and right i was gonna get to that in in 1994 yeah. and I, you, you could finish it. I know where you're going. There was a second mission, and that is when Steve Bannon um, staged his takeover. And when St Steve Bannon staged his takeover, two Biospherians from the first mission attempted to break in to, to try to free the other Biospherians. They, they broke the glass and let in outside air. Y yeah, it's, it's more nuanced than that. But yes, they broke a glass pane. And... Um, Basically, it, it it all went afoul, and and Steve Bannon, you know, sued them. There's there's more drama associated with Steve Bannon and these two biospherians who tried to break in, 
but I really, it, it just like talking about the ending, it just kind of keeps spiraling, but like to no end. It's kind of like the whole point was the group of people who conceived of the project were kicked out and that was the end of their dream and their vision. So right. to me, that kind of topsy-turvy twist at the end, even though there's something juicy about it, it actually just became confusing and TMI almost. So I didn't go into it. I chose to just focus on this first group and what their experience was and, and the loss of the group who, who the project was taken away from. Well, it was fascinating to see Bannon, you know, come up as as a late as a late hour villain. Uh, you know, he still is a, a problem for Biosphere One, Planet Earth that we live on. Uh, w was there ever going to be more threading to that, or did you just want him to come out of nowhere? Because I was I was curious if he had some peripheral, you know, tagging around with some of the people in the group, or maybe Ed Bass or somebody like that. He was a Goldman Sachs banker who was hired to bring kind of fiduciary control responsibility to the project. And he is someone who had done corporate takeovers before, I think, in restructuring. And so he now, of course, is a contemporary political villain. And it was like a metaphor laid out on a silver platter for me as, you know, Steve Bannon takes over this miniature world just as he helped um, facilitate the taking over of our yeah. present world. But um, yeah, I mean, there wasn't any kind of conspiratorial connection to Steve Bannon and the project. He just happened to be the banker who was brought in to take over. And, and one of our subjects captured him in, in these, you know, kind of incendiary tapes, just um, really uh, just, you know, being a pig. Hey, I'm just cutting in really quick to remind you, if you want to see the documentary, make sure to go to backstory.net slash spaceship earth. There's a link right there. Half the proceeds of you renting the movie for $3.99, they will go to Backstory Magazine because of our partnership with Neon, the distributor of the film. So I'm really excited for that, and I hope that's the way that you watch it and you spread the link around. You can, of course, watch a trailer for the movie right there at backstory.net slash Spaceship Earth. You'll, you'll find it all right there. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good film, so don't just watch the interview or listen to the podcast. I hope you actually watch the movie itself. And if you're enjoying the experience of Backstory.net while you're surfing around online, remember you could use code SAVE5 to save $5 off a purchase of a one-year subscription. So we're getting ready to do issue 42. It's going to be our new issue that we're doing during this uh, uncertain time in the world. There's going to be a lot of great stuff in it. So if you want to support independent film journalism, I hope you'll consider subscribing to Backstory as well. But now let's get right back into our conversation with director Matt Wolf about making his documentary, Spaceship Earth. We're gonna, we're gonna take questions from the crowd in a couple of minutes, so if you wanna type them into the chat window on the side, I have somebody monitoring that who's gonna text me a few. Uh, so just for, for the folks that are, that are with us live, but it's interesting, I still don't understand this part. If Ed Bass you know, fronted the whole $200 million, $250 million project, why was another bank coming in? Like who, who wanted to get control over it? That, that, that's the part of it that I didn't really understand. Well, the pro I mean, Ed Bass, in the end, had given $200 million to the project, but the prog project was hemorrhaging costs. It was way over budget. And oh, okay. It was conceived as this 100-year project. It would cost so much money to continue the project as it had been conceived. And right. in the eyes of the public and the media, it had been a failure and wasn't produ And this kind of scientific committee was saying it wasn't producing meaningful research. It's the whole thing had kind of spiraled out of control and it wasn't feasible for Ed to continue funneling money to, to the, the management. It's, it's just so funny project. that another committee could come in and tell you that you can't continue your experiment when really no one was getting hurt. I mean, and, and yeah, the results, and I the think, results were I never going to be financial. The project was never conceived to facilitate traditional academic scientific research. And it right. was this bizarre and elaborate instrument that had been created to do a really particular thing. And of course, these private scientists, or not these private scientists, these academic scientists from mainstream institutions were meant to lend credibility to the project, but they would have approached creating this tool in a very different way. And, and also academic scientists rely on private funding as well. And I'm sure we're very interested in, in having the relationship with Ed Bass as well. So there were a lot of competing interests at that point. And I think to me, I, I do uh, recognize and understand why people perceive Biosphere 2 to be a failure, but, but to me, I, I don't see it wholly as a failure. I think that's too black and white, but I think that 
the ultimate failure of Biosphere 2 is that it's not being used as the closed system it was designed to be and that so much intention went into. Yeah. I, one of the things that, that, that wasn't in the documentary that I'm curious if there was footage on and you ever considered was a few people went in there as couples. Um, you know, they were girlfriend, boyfriend, et cetera. And I was curious how their relationships fared during it, if they stayed together afterwards, because you mentioned it and we saw them, you know, close together, but it, it just wasn't clear to me that aspect. And I don't know if that's too off, off target for what you wanted to do with your documentary, but was that ever a part of it? They're still couples. Those, those two couples chose not to be part of the documentary though. Oh, okay. So it was hard to get into. I think um, the people who- couldn't you, but, the, So you couldn't use their footage at all because you didn't have a release technically, right? Uh, no, that wasn't the case, but I didn't have interviews with them. So we didn't really go into their story in a detail. Okay. Well, you feel their presence in the film, but yeah. you know the, the people you come to know in a deeper sense are those who are interviewed. And, and those actually happen to be the single people who are in there. Interesting. All right. Uh, I, I'm curious, you know, anything else in the editing room that, that you had to, to get rid of that maybe you hung on to for a long time? Because that, that always happens in documentaries. You're just under two hours, um, but you had, as you said, over 600 hours of footage. So was there anything else that, it, you know, when a Blu-ray comes out might be on the bonus features? No. There wasn't. Really? You know, I, I really am not a precious person in an edit. It's once something's gone, I forget it ever was there. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that I was seeing from Alex Romanelli, how did you think their experience would differ now in the context of social media versus the early 90s if they were doing this? It's interesting. I don't think about it in terms of social media, but they, I mean, they communicated with the outside world through the tools that existed in the early 90s. They had fax, they had really early primitive video conferencing technology and um, walkie talkie and phone. So they were in touch much the way that we're socializing now kind of remotely during quarantine. But I think that the entire project would have been perceived different in, in a kind of um, post internet age because the model in which they're operating this kind of gregarious personality who has a huge amount of pi private equity who is doing a kind of futurist project that's outside the realm of what's been done before um, you know, that's very dot com. It's very Elon Musk. It's the kind of disruptor culture that people talk about in Silicon Valley. So there's a precedent for it. And back then there wasn't. And I think that's part of why people were suspicious and skeptical of the project because there were these outsiders, whereas now out, outsider disruptor innovator types are it's, it's a familiar trope and people are accustomed to a lot of startups not working. Um, so I think the larger perception of the project would have been different. We're also in a time where environmentalism and sustainability are more mainstream ideas, whereas then it wasn't part of the vernacular in the same way. Um, but I also think that the media's relationship to the project would have been different because they're just, it would be easy to find out who these people were and what their backgrounds were. It wouldn't become this kind of, um, bamboozling surprise. So I think like, um, it, it's, um, just every aspect of the project would have been different. And I wonder if it would have been done today, but I could definitely see something like this happening and, and having a different perception in the popular culture. Yeah, I see one of the questions from Chelsea Christer. She, she actually works at Sundance uh, each festival and is a documentarian herself. Her question was, can you talk about constructing your narrative and deciding where you wanted to start the film and how deep you wanted to go into the backstory of the collective and I, I would add, knowing that you needed to eventually get to Biosphere. Yeah, I, t I chose a counterintuitive route to spend a huge amount of time on the prehistory of the project. Um, it's a kind of structure I've seen in books that I like, where you kind of like go against expectation and you go way back to set up all the ideas and intention that went into the main event. There's a book by Michael Bracewell about Roxy Music called... Um, oh, remake, remodel, um, the making of Roxy Music. And the entire book is about everything that led up to Roxy Music coming together and making their first record. So you don't get that fan hagiography hey, about Roxy Music. It's just the entire cultural context of art schools in England and pop art and how it all kind of synthesized in Roxy Music is then this kind of idea. And, and that really interests me. And also obviously the film Teenage I Made is not about teenage youth culture in the 1950s with rockers and then punks. It's it's all these things that happened before. So I, I'm 
predisposed to like that kind of thing, but also I was just drawn to that story, these characters and that material in the archive. I just, I thought it was interesting. And so as much as Biosphere 2 was interesting to me, I never wanted to make a really geeky film about all the ins and outs of it. And I didn't want to make a, the kind of story about it. it's this epic failure. It just, there's, a, there's an existing media narrative, which I didn't find particularly interesting about the project, but I did find what Biosphere 2 was. as both an idea as a project that had a particular fate to be interesting. So for all the things that I found interesting about Biosphere 2, it was necessary to go deep into this prehistory so that Biosphere 2 as an idea, not just as, as an event, was, would resonate. I know by all the participants doing some of the press with this movie, they still say that they would go back into the biosphere. And yeah, I, yeah. I, wonder if, and I wonder if that'll happen. It won't happen, but I think that what, what they're saying in a way is that they fell in love with the world that they had created and that they were responsible to maintain. And that is in some ways the dilemma that we face now is that there's a woman in the film in some archival footage. This was one of my favorite clips, which I would have been very sad if it didn't make it into the film and it didn't for a while, but finally we found a way in. It's a woman, she's wearing big 80s glasses and she says, this isn't gonna work. People are too abusive. People abuse our world. It's going down the tubes. And, and to me, that was like a kind of thesis statement about the film in a way. It's kind of like, it wasn't gonna work because we do abuse our worlds. And, and these people had fallen in love with their worlds and it was destroyed, it was taken away from them in a sense. But that I think um, what, if we all kind of fell in love with our world, we would live in a very different society, you know? Yeah, what, you know, I know we're running out of time, but uh, what's, what was your toughest scene? What was the scene that you kept sweating again and again to get right? And how did you creatively rise to the challenge of finding it? Well, I think one of the toughest moments in the film was to really identify what the climax of the story is. In a sense, there's this confrontation between John Allen and the ecologist, Tony Burgess, who goes and kind of tattletales on him to the overseeing scientific community who's at odds with John. And um, the biospherians find out about this and there's this kind of dramatic confrontation where you know, John, who's kind of potentially a violent kind of figure in this story, uh, confronts Tony and in a kind of Shakespearean moment, um, you know, says he's going to go to the depths of hell for betrayal and then hugs him. And I always, you know, during that, that's an example of a moment in an interview where I knew kind of the outcome of that story and I had read transcripts and seen archival material to let me know I could dramatize this aspect of the story, but the hugging thing at the end, I mean, ugh. It was so Shakespearean. And so in a way that was the climax, but it actually wasn't, I discovered. It wasn't playing as the climax of the story. We needed there to be a kind of um, breaking point in which John had kind of lost control and in which the, the miniature world of Biosphere 2 is kind of experiencing plagues and, and destined to um, implode and at the same time, we had to kind of remind people that this whole project was conceived because this group recognized the threat of climate change. So we needed to at once, I think that was the, 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 the kind of tragedy of the project is that the intentions were there, but the whole thing had spiraled out of control. And so we had to construct this kind of operatic sequence and, and David Teague, the editor did an incredible job um, creating a, a really creative montage to do that. But it, it really was hard to show the, the collision of intention and outcome and how it had all kind of fallen apart. And that was the climax of the film. And, and the confrontation between John Allen and Tony became the outcome of that. So that, I think that was the hardest thing to craft actually. I think, I think one of the easiest things to end on, because I know we're running out of time here, is that you know this is a film that came out during quarantine about two people that Sorry, about eight people that purposely put themselves into two years worth of quarantine. And yeah. one of the things that we didn't see as much of is how did they cope with the isolation? At least they were together in the group, but I know people that are, you know, in apartments by themselves and, and it's a different kind of isolation. What were some of the tips and tricks that you, you gleaned in looking at 600 hours of footage from the Biospherians that you think would be good advice for people that are in quarantine these days? Well, I think one thing I learned is that people kept busy they really, really had a lot of work to do. And I think there's a perception that there was this kind of extreme Big Brother style drama inside. And I think 
there was drama inside, but that it was often mitigated by the fact that there was a lot to do. There was just a lot of work. They had to feed themselves by farming. They had to take all these measurements. They had to vacuum. I mean, they really had a full to-do list. So I think that's helpful. But one thing that um, Mark and Linda, the two biospherians I've been doing press and events with have said is that it was really helpful for them to have feasts or celebrations as a way to mark time. And whenever somebody had a, a birthday, no matter how much conflict they were all having, everybody would come together to have a feast or if there was a holiday like Thanksgiving, but over the course of two years, there wasn't always a, a celebratory moment to have a feast. So they would make one up. And I thought that was a great kind of, a great kind of piece of advice for right now is this is going on much longer than anybody expected. And we have to mark the passage of time and do some things to not necessarily celebrate, but to, to break bread, for lack of a better word. Well, I absolutely can't wait to see what you do next. You've been very generous with your time. Thank, thanks again for joining us today, Matt. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. And that's how the Q&A went down. Thanks again to director Matt Wolf for chatting about his latest film, Spaceship Earth. And remember, you could watch Spaceship Earth in its entirety at www.backstory.net slash Spaceship Earth. That'll give you a special link where each rental that you make of $4.99, sorry, of $3.99 will be sliced in half and half the proceeds will go to Backstory. The others will go to our partners, Neon, the distributor of the film. We're really grateful for them including us in this. So if you want to support Backstory, if you want to support independent film like Neon, please go to backstory.net slash Spaceship Earth, watch the documentary. And while you're there, if you want to subscribe to our magazine, which we would love for you to do, you could use coupon code SAVE5. It will save you $5 off a subscription. So we're coming out with our new issue soon, and a lot of great journalists are going to participate in it. And if you want to support independent film journalism along with independent film, it would be great to have you as a subscriber. Thanks again for tuning in today. And remember, as always, this podcast and this now YouTube cast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2020, all rights reserved. And I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.